So, welcome back. In this video, we'll illustrate the Metropolis Hastings algorithm with the help of an example. It's a Markov chain with a Poisson distribution with parameter lambda as the stationary distribution. Good, so what do we need? First, pi of x must be the weight of a Poisson distribution then. So that is e to the minus lambda, lambda to the x divided by x factorial for all x in the set of positive integers including zero. And lambda is a positive number, it's the rate, and we get to choose this. So let's not worry about that now. And to be careful for use later, it only takes positive values, so that will be zero for all negative x. And I should, just to connect it what we did, say what is the state space in this case. The state space is the set of all possible values, and we have a choice. We could either just use n0, or we can use a larger discrete set. And what I want to do here is I want to use the integers positive and negative. So if statements, and then we can here write for all x in s, and s we get to pick, and here I take the integers positive and negative. Good. So that's the first thing. We need to say what do we want, and we want the Poisson distribution. And we could either take it as a distribution on the positive integers or on all integers. And if I choose all integers, I need to put zeros as the weights for negative numbers. Then we need to choose the transition probabilities that's used here for generating the proposals. So we need some transition matrix. And here I want to use the transition probabilities of what's called a simple and symmetric random walk. And this simple and symmetric random walk is a process on the integers which in each step goes up one or down one with probability one half. So that's a Markov chain and the corresponding transition matrix of this Markov chain I want to use here. So let's write what I just said. So we go up or down with probability one half. So the probability of making a step from x to y is one half if the new value y is x plus one. It's one half if y equals x minus 1, and there are no other possible values for y, so 0 otherwise. We can check for given x, these values need to add up to 1. So it works nicely. If I fix x and sum over all y, then I come past x minus 1, and I come past x plus 1, so I get these two 1 halves, and I get all other values, but they don't contribute, so the sum over all y's for any x equals 1 half plus 1 half is 1. So that's a valid transition matrix. Next step is we need to pick an x0 in S which has positive probability according to pi. So there are lots of values. We can take any positive integer or 0. So here, let's just say for simplicity, x0 is 0. Again, there's a choice. We could even choose it randomly. But for now, let's just pick x0 equals 0 as the simplest value. Then the next step is more interesting. We need to work out what is this alpha. Let me just copy that. So here it is. So for this example, we get minimum of pi of y pyx over pi of x pxy with 1 equals. Now we need to be a bit careful. There are some cases where p equals 1 half, and there are other cases where p equals 0. In any case, pi, we have a formula. So let's fill in the pi first, and then we worry about p's. So that is minimum of e to the minus lambda, lambda to the y over y factorial. That's the thing you need to be a bit careful about when you are starting to memorize this. The y is on top, the x is at the bottom, so it's kind of backwards. Pi of y, pyx is in the numerator. And in the denominator, we have pi of x, so it's e to the minus lambda lambda to the x over x factorial, and you already see we will be able to cancel the e to the minus lambda. Then we need the pi y x, and the only possible values were 1 half and 0. And one good thing is p y x is 1 half if p x y is 1 half. Just the rule here really is it's 1 half if x and y differ by 1, positive or negative, and otherwise it's 0. So if x and y differ by 1, then y and x also differ by 1, because we are ignoring signs. So one case is where we have 1 half here and 1 half there, if x and y differ by 1. And the other case is where this 
is zero, but there is some unfortunate thing going on. In this case, the denominator is also zero. So in this case, that's not actually defined. So I write question marks because in this case we divide by zero. So that's one thing we need to look out for. You will see in a minute that does not matter. We never run into the second case. So we will only need the first case because we will only ever plug in X and Y, which differ only by one. And there is one more special case we need to consider, namely this formula I used is only true if X is positive. Otherwise we get zero. So this formula holds only if, well, first we used it in the numerator. So if y is greater or equal to zero. And also we need x greater or equal to zero because otherwise we just divide it by zero down here. So, and x and y must be positive. So the first case is only if x and y are positive. If x is negative, we are in the otherwise case, but there is one case we still need to do, namely if x equals zero and y equals minus one, that is a case where we still have this formula. And in this case, minimum of, let me just write that out, e to the minus lambda, lambda to the y divided by y factorial times zero divided by e to the minus lambda, lambda to the x over x factorial times one half minimum with one if x equals zero and y is minus one. Let's check this. So if both x and y are positive and differ by one, then we have this for pi, one half for p, and we get this formula. x and y differ by one, x and y are both positive. If either x is negative or x and y differ by a value different from one, then either this is zero or that is zero, we divide by zero and that is not defined. That is this case. And the last gap is if they differ by one, y is negative, but x is positive, then we have this formula here. But just up here, we go into this special case for y and we get a zero for y. That's what I wrote here. That is the only other case. And in this case, you see that simplifies minimum of zero and one, so that is zero. And this is a very typical situation. If you use the Markov chain Monte Carlo method, and if there are regions where the process cannot go, or boundary cases like the zero here, which is the smallest possible value, then you need to be really, really careful in constructing your alpha, because these boundary cases, they sometimes may break the pattern. So we have throughout this quite regular formula, only for this special case, zero and one, we have zero, which is different from this formula. So there may be special cases at the boundaries. And if you don't get them right, then you get the wrong algorithm and everything which follows is wrong. So be careful when you construct your alpha to properly deal with boundary cases. So let's just copy the alpha to a new page. So that's the formula we found. And let me just do some simplifications. So we can cancel the e to the minus lambda here. You see, we can cancel the one half here. And I can rewrite that a bit. I'll do that in a second to bring everything onto one fraction. So for this case, we will get minimum of lambda to the y divided by y factorial and the denominator will turn around. So we get x factorial here, lambda to the x minimum with one. Then the second case, we just had zero. And the third case, which I claimed we will never hit is undefined. So that's if x, y positive, x minus y differ by one. Zero is if x is zero, y is minus one. And the undefined case is everything else. And there is a final simplification instead of lambda to the y divided by lambda to the x, we can write lambda y minus x. So I can write lambda y minus x times x factorial over y factorial. Good, so that is the alpha we are going to use. Now let's tackle this question, why do we not hit the undefined case? So the undefined case we hit either if x is negative or if x and y are not direct neighbors. So we need to look at the algorithm. In the algorithm, let's see what we plug in here. Statement is we are not plugging in negative values for x and we are always plugging in direct neighbors. So the first thing is very easy, namely y is generated by 
during one step of a simple symmetric random walk starting at the previous state. And the simple symmetric random walk always goes up one or down one, so yj always is different from xj minus one by one, either in positive or negative direction. Now, why can x not be negative? This answer is slightly more subtle, namely there are two things we need to consider. First, if j equals one, then xj minus one is x zero, and there we get the value we chose. And this is why the condition pi of x zero is positive is written here. That is just there to avoid dividing by zero here when j equals one. Then at later steps, xj minus one is really what we chose by this algorithm in the previous step. So we need to be sure we never choose a negative value in our example here. So the question is, how could we get negative? Well, we either have the previous value, which by an induction argument we can assume is good because the first one is good and I'm just arguing if we are good, then the next step is good. So the question is really, can we get a proposal which is negative? And the answer is no. Because if you look here, alpha xy is the probability of accepting proposal at y if we come from x. And here you see if the proposal is negative, the probability of accepting it equals zero. So that thing here, that's a bit subtle, that says we never accept negative proposals in this example. And that means xj can never become negative. So xj never gets one of the forbidden values. And that was just arguing for the example, but the same argument goes through here. So if you think about this, p x y must always be positive because we just chose y according to this transition probabilities, and we only can choose values with positive transition probabilities. And pi of x is always non-zero by the logic we just said, namely in the first step we are okay just because that's part of the specification here. And in the following steps, we always can only reach values which before have been accepted, and values are not accepted if pi of the value equals zero. So why is the proposal? If pi of y is zero, we never accept it, so we will never reach a state where we have in the next step pi of x zero here, because that could only happen if we had accepted it before. So we will never hit these undefined cases here. And if we do that in a program, we don't need to worry about this case. We can just assume we are good and use these formulas up here. We don't need to implement that because it's not going to happen. So these are the transition probabilities we need to use. Now we are good to go. Namely, we have said what is pi. We have discussed how to choose x0. We know how to generate y, namely it is a simple symmetric random walk. We take the previous state, go up or down with probability one half. We know anyway how to generate u, and we know what alpha is. It's the formula I've just shown you. It's this one. And we can just use what we learned before about accept reject mechanisms to implement that in a computer, very similarly to what we did for rejection sampling. So let's go and try that in R. Okay, so let's see what we can do. Our aim is to simulate path from a Markov chain, which has a Poisson distribution with parameter lambda as its stationary distribution. So first thing we need lambda, let's just fix it at one. Then we need pi to give us the Poisson weights. What I would try is whether we can just use the built-in deep poise function. So we need function x is the let's bring up the help. So x goes first, and then lambda goes in here. Let's try that. Then pi of 0 is 0 0.367879, and that should equal exponential of minus lambda times lambda to the x, x is 0, is 1, divided by x factorial, and for this definition, 0 factorial also counts as 1, so that should be exponential of minus lambda. That works. Let's just try pi of 1. That should be e to the minus lambda times lambda to the 1 divided by 1 factorial, which is just 1. That also matches, so that works. And the question is, do we get 0 for negative values? It does work. So we can use this for pi, then we don't need to have the if-else statement. Next, we need to define p. And I said we are going to use a simple and symmetric random walk, so that means 
if x and y have distance 1, then the probability is 1 half, and otherwise it's 0. And then we need alpha, so that should be minimum of pi of y times py x, and that needs to be divided by pi of x and by pxy, and the minimum of that and 1. So I did not use the simplifications for alpha we wrote in the notes yet, but I did something which looks closer to the general theory. Now we need to implement the algorithm. So let's say xj we start with 0. We said that's a possible value because pi of xj is positive. We are good. And then let's just do 10 steps for practice for j in 1 to 10. We need to do something and we need a vector to store the results in. And so we take a vector of length n, we step from 1 to n, and this time we can use a for loop. It looks like rejection sampling, but since we do not ignore rejected values, but just replace them with the previous value, we know how many iterations there are going to be. It will be n iterations always, so for loop is fine. And then we need the proposal, yj is... Well, and now we cannot easily use this p, but instead we just use what we know about the simple symmetric random walk. So that is either xj plus 1 or xj minus 1. So xj I use for the previous state. So we can use sample, which makes random decisions. And x is a vector of one or more elements from which to choose. That's what we want. So we do xj minus 1 and xj plus 1. Then size is how many we want, number of items to choose. We want one of them. And we could give the probabilities as 1 half and 1 half. But I believe if we don't say what the probability is, it takes equal probabilities. So that's the proposal. Then we need one standard uniform to decide whether to accept or reject. And then we do xj, the new values, is if else u less than or equal to alpha, and now the previous value, yj. And if it's less than or equal to, we accept, so then we take yj, or else we take the previous value. I think that may be right, and then we store that in our vector. Okay, before I try that, I want to just talk you through the slightly confusing thing with the xj. Namely, here I would need to plug in the previous value, and similarly here. And in the mathematical notation, I did this by writing xj minus 1 here and here, and xj here. So there was this distinction. Similarly, here we need the previous value. So in the mathematical notation, I would have written xj minus 1 here. But in the ARC program, I don't need to do that. and I can't really write xj minus 1. So what I do is I just assume that for these two lines and for these two lines xj still contains the previous value and only once we do this assignment xj is replaced with the current value. That works because if we come in I've assigned the initial value to xj then until this point in the first iteration of the loop xj indeed contains x0, so the 0. And similarly, inside this line, xj is not changed until the right-hand side is evaluated. So here still xj and xj contains the initial value 0 in the first iteration. And then here, once we have evaluated the right-hand side, that's assigned to xj, changing the value into the new one. And the same logic holds for the second iteration, namely for the second iteration, xj is still what we assigned in the first iteration here and there and here and there. So even if it's called xj logically, it's xj minus 1 because it's the leftover values from the previous iteration. And only once we have evaluated the right-hand side, we assign it to xj, changing it to the current value. Their mathematical notation and notation in R differs a bit, but this program does what we want. And then here, when we assign to the j's element of the vector x, we actually get the new value because we did produce this in the previous row. Good. So Let's just try and run that. So x has now some values, and you see it's only 1 and 0. And that may be okay, because if I do a bar plot 
this way of the weights. You will see the first two are by far the largest, so the process is not meant to be very often a two, three, and so on. So now we have it with numbers. So zero and one are the most frequent ones. Let's just do n equals 100 and see what we get. So you see we get the occasional two, and if we do 1000, then it is too many to show them, but I can do a table. So you see we get nearly the same amount of zeros and ones, about half as many twos, that's consistent with the plot, and then fewer threes and fours and fives and six. So that could very well be a sample from a Poisson distribution. Let's go back to a smaller number of steps and do plot 1, 2, 50 and x and type both lines and points. Then you see what's happening. The process is always moving in jumps of size one. That's what we know would happen. Namely, the proposals always go up or down one. So here proposal went up and was accepted. Here proposal went up and was accepted. Now here it stays flat for a while, so it doesn't move. And you see that's what we expect when the algorithm rejects. If we reject, we stay with the old value. So here we rejected once and twice. And here we went up once more and was accepted, down, accepted, down, accepted, down, accepted, up, accepted, down, accepted. And here we don't know what the proposal was, but whatever it was, it was rejected. And that happens quite a lot down here. So here another plot which shows the graphs again with a bit nicer margins. And what you see is if I run the code again, I get different path. That's because the Markov chain is a random function of time. Now, as the next step, what I want to do is I want to show you some evidence that the distribution of the xj is approximately equal to a Poisson distribution with parameter lambda. So doing this first, I generate much more samples that we can look at histograms. So let's say 10 to the 5. And then doing that plot makes no sense anymore because we can't plot 10 to the 5 points. So first thing we can do a table of values we have seen. We have 37,000 zeros, 36,000 ones, and so on. So let's store this table. Then we can plot a bar plot which shows us what would we expect if the samples are possibly distributed. And what we do is d Poisson, say 0 to 10 for the heights. And we use also 0 to 10 to 10 for the numbers underneath the bars. And I forgot the lambda, let's put that here. So we got this. Now, how can we add the values from the table in there? First, you still see the table here. That is counts and not frequencies, so we should divide by n so that it becomes compatible with the frequencies in the plot. So frequency, say, is t divided by n. If we do that, we get proper frequencies, it will add up to one. And now we just need to work out how do we add these to the bar plot points. And for doing this, let me see, maybe the help of bar plot knows. Maybe it is faster to just do a quick Google search. So let's see, Google suggests this page, and this contains indeed the answer. It suggests what I think is a naive way, and it says that will not work. And it says we should look at the bar plot object. Let's do that. So let's call it BP. Then it says BP turns out a matrix. And here there's only one column. And I believe it just said that we should use these values as X values. Matrix object with one column, these are the values that are assumed on X axis. Let's try that. So we do BP first column, columns are the second argument. And I think what we need to do is we just need to write one to eight here and I think it will be all good. That did in fact work. Now we just need to adjust the margins a bit that we can actually see this. So let's do y lim is the range from zero to 0.4. That is already mildly better. And then we can make the points a bit more obvious if I do PCH is 16, it works. So here we are. This plot shows that we got a rather good fit. The red points are the frequency we got from the Markov chain. 
and the gray bars are the frequencies we expect for Poisson distribution. And you see there is an excellent match. And the Poisson distribution, of course, allows values up to infinity. So you see in the plot here, there's 8 and 9 and 10. But the probabilities are extremely small. So in this case, here you see there are 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 6, and 10 to the minus 7. So we would need more than a million of points that we actually would see values like 8 and 9 and 10. As a final test, let's just check whether we treated lambda correctly. If I do lambda equals 2, then the plot will slightly change, but hopefully the red circus will change correspondingly. That did not work because my 8 here probably broke. So if now, hopefully, yes, we still get the perfect fit. The one thing I want to point out here, and I have not discussed this in the theory part yet, but I have hinted at it here. We will use the Markov chains to generate samples from a given distribution. And so far we have only said we want this to be the stationary distribution. The experiment with the histogram shows we seem to be converging towards the stationary distribution and the samples we generate look actually like the distribution of the XJ equals the Poisson distribution here. That is the fact which we'll use in the next videos.